I'm just going to make a few more uh, local announcements. Uh, so uh, yesterday, um, there was one uh, sponsor that we did not uh, name, but which is very relevant today, because today we're doing the doctoral consortium, and that's the NSF. So the NSF provided a grant to fund the travel and attendance of a variety of doctoral consortium students, and we're very appreciative of that. And I think uh, Janet just walked into the back of the room. Do I see Janet back there? Janet's yes, so let's all thank Janet. And are there any students, uh, I know the room is half empty, who received funding for the doctoral consortium? Can I see a show of hands? Yeah, maybe stand up, maybe stand up. Yes, there you go. Yes. <laughs> Don't miss, their, uh, yeah, don't miss their talks today. Okay, so um, something else I want to note about lunch. Um, there is, uh, when we sit down for lunch, there are tables. There are tables around the registration desk. There are tables uh, along the kind of long uh, glass wall. Um, but there are also tables in what we call the private dining room. And it says reserved for a private function, but that private function is us. So if you're, if you're, if you're eating lunch and you're like, wow, there aren't enough tables, there are enough tables, you just need to go to that private dining room if, if you're kind of looking for lunch. <laughs> so that is over by the cafe. So there's a cafe that has a chain link kind of wall around it, so we don't you know, steal food for ourselves out of the cafe, but right next to the cafe is a little door, and it'll say reserved for a private function. And it actually has a glass wall, so it's not as hard to see as I'm, I'm making it sound. It's actually very close to the dessert cart. So if you're by the dessert cart, you should be able to see it very clearly. Okay, so. Um, also, the banquet is tonight. We're going to have buses on Patterson Drive. Um, this is also on the signs, but Patterson Drive is on the west side of the FIT. And finally, if you uh, are driving a car and you need parking passes, we have uh, complimentary um, parking passes so you don't have to, to pay for parking. I'm, I'm going to request that if you're walking from across the street that you not use these. But if you're driving from like a hotel someplace, please use them. And the way that they work, which is a little confusing, when you get your parking ticket, don't put that in. Instead, put in one of these blue parking passes, and it'll comp you. Um, so that it kind of says that on the card, but people often get confused by that. Okay, so what time are the buses? The buses uh, are going to start loading at 6:30, and we also have that on signs. Um, we'll get to the zoo tonight. The weather uh, looks like it's going to be very nice. There's a cold front coming in, so it'll be windy. Yes, yes, lows, lows tonight in the upper 60s. So uh, the weather has cooperated for us. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it's going to be about the humidity, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. So uh, Chad, are you going to introduce? So Chad is going to introduce our keynote speaker. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a, a few things uh, before I introduce Maria. Uh, well, first, my favorite moment from yesterday was uh, getting my food and reaching the end of the table, and there's Ryan Baker next to his poster with a really sad look on his face saying, I picked the wrong spot for my poster. <laughs> Everybody's standing on the full plate of food waiting for him to finish his presentation. Uh, so today, uh, just a few announcements. Um, people ask about the best papers. We showed them yesterday. There's a sign up near the registration desk somewhere. They're now identified on the website. So you can find those if you'd like to, to know what they, which papers they are. There's actually one today in 4C um, by Long and Laban. So, and then two tomorrow. Um, in the booklet, uh, there's a slight error. Sec uh, session 6C uh, has the wrong start time. It should be 1.45, so don't get confused tomorrow. It's not a morning session, it's an afternoon session. Um, and then we had a late change in the doctoral consortium. Uh, is Sydney here? Okay, uh, the, the talk by uh, Dovan Rai is canceled, so that's the second to last one in DCB. Um, so be, be prepared for that if you go to the DC. In case you couldn't make it because of the so. uh, Okay, so uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce Maria. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how we met and, and uh, why she's here. This actually all started with Art. Uh, is Art here? Okay, so Art introduced me to a, to a guy from the European Commission who was named Marco Marcella back in Pittsburgh. Uh, Marco and I stayed in touch, uh, and I ended up going over to the European Commission a few times to review proposals and projects, uh, and met Maria there. So what's interesting about this conference is I think it's the first time we've actually had a chance to talk about our own work. 
in all previous situations, we've been talking about the work of others. Um, so, uh, you know, Maria has been, you know, a mentor, a wayfinder for me in the commission. So it's been really, really excellent to work closely with her there. Um, I learned very quickly that the things Maria said in the meetings and uh, when we were discussing things offline, that she said interesting and thoughtful and meaningful things pretty much every time she opened her mouth. And so this is the sign of what you want in an invited speaker. So sorry to embarrass you. But not everyone has that trait, uh, so it, it was it really impressed me. And so, um, she, uh, you know, she's committed to using technology to promote learning, and you're going to see that in her talk. And I think one of the things that makes it unique and interesting for us is that her focus is directly on informal learning, and she has extensive experience in museums, and there are unique challenges that these environments pose. Uh, it's a real chance to inform the public, engage the public, all ages, all races. Um, and so uh, it's really a unique problem that she's going to be talking about. Um, she was one of the earliest researchers to use virtual reality in museums. Uh, she had a cave uh, available to her when they cost like $80,000, I think is what you said. A million dollars. A million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Give or take a little. Uh, uh, Maria, you know, is a, a, also a very interesting academic background. She has an MFA, uh, a Master of Fine Arts, and a Master of Science in Computer Science from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, and then she uh, received a little later her PhD in Computer Science from UCL, University of London. Uh, I did a little looking into UCL, and they're a pretty fascinating university. They actually have five museums that are associated with the university. I, I don't know of any other place quite like that. Uh, so a very fertile uh, location to do research and informal learning, no doubt. Uh, she's also the founder and co-director of Make Believe, and we're going to hear a little bit about some of the work she's done in her, her company. Uh, she's an adjunct le lecturer at the University of Athens. Um, and I think, kind of to embarrass her a little more before I, I introduce you up, uh, Maria's career is really a wonderful example of how you can blend a whole bunch of goals into one coherent picture. She owns a company, she conducts research, she publishes papers, she maintains academic connections, and she does work that she loves. So I think it's really admirable and a wonderful example. Uh, ask her questions about any of those things, but we're going to hear mostly about the fun stuff that she's going to use against today. Welcome. Gosh, after all of that, don't expect me to sing. <laughs> conference will just end right now if I do that. <laughs> um, thank you, Chad. Chad Lina. Where is Kalina? Okay. I prefer the more glamorous version of the combined name. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, I'm very happy to say that this is my second AI Ed. The first one being 17 years ago at the European AI Ed. Um, in Lisbon, Portugal, where I presented a paper as a graduate student, and I'll talk um, about that at a moment, in a moment. So I'm a peripheral member of this community. Um, nonetheless, I hope that you can find something interesting or useful for your work um, in what I have to say a little bit later. <clears throat> so, sorry, I have this um, dry throat from the air condition. I'm used to dry, uh, dry weather, <laughs> not dry air conditioning. So, back then, in 1996, I presented a project, um, this was my master's thesis, um, which was a virtual environment for children called the NICE Project. It was the first one of its kind because immersive virtual reality cave-based systems, rooms that are projector-based, um, were very new then in the early 90s, or mid-90s, and they had not been used with children for educational purposes. So the NICE project was a virtual garden which was simulating or attempted to simulate the process of photosynthesis, but in a very cartoonish sort of way, um, using metaphors for, uh, let's say, there was a sun, uh, a 3D model of a sun that the children could uh, move over their plants to give sunlight, um, a cloud to give rain, to give water. Um, if the plants didn't have enough sun, uh, they would hold up, um, wear glasses, or if they had too much water, they would hold up an umbrella, and so on. 
So this was um, evaluated with 52 second graders um, on different axes, um, technical, spatial, emotional, and so on. And the most interesting result was the importance of control. So the kids would go in, in, in groups, but only one kid could use a 3D mouse to interact with the environment. The others were just observing. Um, so the leaders, the ones who were using and interacting the device uh, to interact, were the ones that were more on task and were more engaged. <laughs> but the main shortcoming of this project was that um, the science model was inadequate. In our attempt to make it more engaging and cartoonish, uh, we actually covered up the science and the learning that was behind it, or the one that we attempted to do. So um, the lessons that we learned from this was that um, we would have to find a learning goal um, for VR to make sense for education that was hard, that was important, hard in the sense of deep learning rather than just factual learning, for example, uh, that could be enhanced by this kind of technology. Uh, and digital technology in general, but at the time it was immersive VR that was very trendy, um, and that would exploit the possibilities that interactivity provides. And that's why we came up with um, the Round Earth Project, which <coughs> had to do with a hard problem, a problem that is shown through research um, to um, create misconceptions in children, because what they learn is that the Earth is round, whereas their everyday experience shows that the Earth is flat. So there is this um, conflict um, and this incorrect mental model that we create. So we, did, uh, we created a virtual environment that, um, uh, the scenario was that um, kids are on a mission, uh, they're stranded on an asteroid because their spaceship it has run out of fuel, so they can go around the asteroid, the planet, to find the fuel cells, um, and then they can uh, assume another role, another view outside um, from another asteroid, and see the astronaut that's looking uh, for fuel cells on the planet. So they have the two different views of the round planet, of the round asteroid. This kind of work uh, brought um, even more uh, to the foreground the need to study systematically uh, the effect of interactivity on learning. And that's uh, my, PH work, my PhD work at UCL, um, which, again, uh, tried to identify a hard problem. Uh, this time <coughs> is fractions, mathematical fractions, um, and the misconceptions that they create uh, to children in, in primary education. Um, and the scenario in this work was to redesign a playground. So in the top view, you see uh, the blueprint on top has the, the playground and the area that each of the elements takes up. So for example, the blue area is the slide, the red the swings, and so on. And they have 10 square blocks of area, um, 12 square blocks of area, 16 square blocks of area, and so on. And the children have to actually redesign the playground, redesign the area that each of these elements takes up. Um, using mathematical fractions. Uh, these fractions are given to them um, in the form of a game. There are various characters, each one representing each of the areas. For example, this red bird represents the area that the swings take up. Uh, so um, the bird says hi, I'm the red bird, when the user approaches. Um, the swings are not big enough, uh, they're taking up 12 uh, blocks at this point. Um, so you want to give them as much area as possible. You can make them bigger by one-third of their current space or bigger by, by one-fourth, whichever gives more space. And this is a classic misconception in research. A classic problem is that children tend to um, think that the, the fraction with the biggest denominator is the one that gives you a bigger number. So one-fourth would give them more space, whereas in reality it's one-third that would give more space. Um, I'll show you a video so you can get an idea of the interaction uh, in the environment. If I can get my notes to it here. Yeah. Okay. Um,
the glasses. You can help us direct this and finally have a nice virtual playground to play in. What are you going to leave on the ground for? What? This is an eight-year-old kid from a lower-income class uh, family, a single mother, um, who played computer games about six hours a day. What are you going for? Sorry. <laughs> Should we uh, take a break? No, I love this. <laughs> So this was evaluated with um, about 60 children in three different conditions. One condition was a non-digital condition, so um, children were asked to um, design the playground, redesign the playground using Legos, and the tasks were given to them on cards rather than birds talking. Uh, the other condition had um, 17 participants interacting, fully interacting with the environment, just like the kid that you saw in the video. And the third condition had a what we call the passive VR condition, where children were immersed in the environment, uh, but they were not able to interact themselves. They didn't handle the device, but they were um, observing a virtual robot doing the task, so listening to the bird and doing the task. So they were just looking at what the robot was doing. There was, it was timed, though, in such a way, so they were able to, um, have, they had time to think about what the robot was to do and of course, uh, the observer was asking questions about what do you think um, the robot will be doing. Um, so the main, um, the, the, qual the quantitative and qualitative evaluation uh, was performed on, uh, on these uh, experiments, on the data collected through the studies. The data was observation data, pre and post tests, um, and interviews, semi-structured interviews. Uh, the quantitative analysis showed some improvement in performance for the children that entered the, uh, that used um, the virtual reality environment, whether that was interactive or passive, but not as much uh, to give us a useful, uh, useful measures. Um, the qualitative analysis, which um, used activity theory as a framework, um, showed that, um, as you also saw in the video, that um, children were able to uh, correctly redesign their playground, um, especially in the, in, the, in the interactive VR condition, um, because it supported trial and error. 
and um, because they were able or used to computer games, so they would do this all the time. And this was um, the, the video showed very vividly um, how that was done by the specific child. So there was some problem solving. However, it was the passive VR condition that showed evidence of some kind of sustained conceptual change in the sense that there was more um, chance to reflect on what was going to happen. So the, the, the virtual robot took on, in some sense, um, the role of a more able peer. Uh, because what the virtual robot was doing was always the correct uh, thing. But in a little bit, there was some time to reflect on what um, was going to happen. So all of this work is background work that um, gives us some insight on how to incorporate interactivity and reflection in the design of digital learning experiences. But um, how do you do that when you're talking about the broad public? Um, because talking about the broad public in contexts such as museums or science centers um, is a task or a challenge of a bigger scale in nature, a very different nature. Um, just to name a few, and I've had this experience because, as Chad mentioned, I set up a cave in a museum um, in Greece in the late 90s, uh, the foundation of the Atlantic world, which was um, which uh, presented um, cities, ancient cities, reconstructed ancient cities, and about 300 children would visit this a day. So I had to deal with everything from scrapping chewing gum from the floor of the cave to um, replacing glasses, replacing devices all the time. <clears throat> but even with other kinds of digital environments, like um, a robotic avatar or um, gesture-based uh, interactive environments, there are many issues that one has to take into account. Compared so, to formal education, uh, the audience that you're targeting in an um, informal context is very different heterogeneous, um, everybody comes with different expectations, different goals, different abilities um, and needs, um, so you have to cater for that uh, when you design a learning environment. Also, you have to take into account that they will have a very brief encounter uh, with the learning content, uh, content. There is no chance for you to work on the longitudinal aspect of the classroom that has a whole school year um, so that you can work on that. What you have to do is to capture their attention immediately and then foster some kind of prolonged engagement. Um, that's quite hard, uh, given that all studies show, especially a very famous exploratorium study um, from the early numbers, showed that visitors spend about 30 seconds um, on each interactive exhibit. So imagine how many, how much less that is in art museums or archaeology museums. <coughs> Uh, also, um, museums and informal education institutions, for the most part, not all of them, are very object-centric. So the artifact is the focus. Um, and the seamless connection between the digital and the physical, the artifact and the object, must be established. Another um, characteristic of uh, informal learning education or centers uh, and context is that people visiting groups, and all studies show this, um, it's the minority of people that actually go alone to visit a museum. <clears throat> so um, there is this tension that one has to cater to um, between individualized learning and the group experience or the social interaction that that requires. <coughs> Some other characteristics uh, have to do with visiting patterns. Everybody has a different visiting style. Um, also, when groups visit, there's a lot of splitting and rejoining. So families or pairs will see something, then come together and do this kind of thing. Um, parents can get dragged away by something that they're viewing from their chi by their children. There's a lot of crowding going on, especially in big, large museums. So they can be, uh, you want to see something, but there's a crowd or a group of tourists um, in front of it. There are different visiting styles. and. There, there are tons of taxonomies that the visitor studies community um, has come up with. So the very famous one is the ant, fish, butterfly, and grasshopper. So um, that uh, Baron and Levis uh, um, anthropologists have um, classified visitor styles into, uh, but many others. And then there are a bunch of practical issues. 
So technology must be robust. It's being handled by different people all the time. Um, in some museums, what we call respectful interaction is required. Um, for example, some museums, or most of the art and archaeology museums, have a don't touch policy um, or photos not allowed policy. So that, um, that really uh, challenges interactivity. Um, encumbrance, people are carrying things uh, all the time. Uh, natural phenomena, especially um, on archaeological sites or outdoor museums, you have sunlight, so how do you see things on your tablet? Um, and uh, the weather is a problem. And this is not so much a practical problem, but last but not least, uh, museum culture and mentality. Um, most museums um, are not open to new or digital technology. Um, and this varies depending on the culture, museum culture, so science museums versus archaeological museums, for example, or history museums, but also um, between countries. So different schemes of funding for museums in the US that are mostly private and they have to find their own funds, and different in Europe, which are mostly state-funded. So what is important for <coughs> informal education is to invite visitors to pull content. And uh, by pulling content, we mean to, to, to use techniques that will support learners to actually actively seek um, the information that they, uh, that they need based on their own interests, on self-interest. This could be translated to personalizing content delivery, um, and this would be better done if there's an audience-centric approach, or a user-centric approach, as they call it in HCI speak. So we wanted to tackle this, these challenges, and try out through the CHESS project, it's an acronym, it's a European funded project, um, a mobile enhanced personalized storytelling experience in two museums. Uh, one is the Acropolis Museum in Athens, a world renowned museum, <coughs> with a collection of objects that are about 2,000 to 2,500 years old, um, originals. And um, the other is the Cité de l'Espace, a very different museum, a science center, uh, an interactive discovery uh, learning center about space, um, with 90% uh, of its visitors being children that go there with their um, schools or with their families. Um, and this museum is based on process rather than object. The object that it has, and it's mostly outdoor, um, uh, and the, the objects are replicas. So you see here a replica of the Mir station, the space station, which can be visited inside and people can learn about how astronauts lived in there and so on. <coughs> Some characteristic visitors of these two museums can be seen here. So the Acropolis Museum um, has various visitors and you can see their views uh, about museums and, and these quotes down here. Um, visitors of different ages, from different cultures, um, a very diverse uh, set of people visit this particular museum, um, some of which are related, for example, the grandson and the grandmother, uh, and so on. Um, and the Cité de l'Espace has a smaller, um, we, can, we can see two characteristic visitors, um, a child and a mother, um, usually if we take aside the student groups, because uh, that's a whole different thing, and we look at um, visit, uh, individual visitors in the sense of uh, non-students with their groups, with their school um, classes, then we can see those uh, different types. So let's meet one of these visitors. Let's meet Natalie. She's uh, German. Uh, she's a young woman who loves her job. She's a web designer, a IT professional, uh, but she has many other interests as well. Um, art design, going out with friends, and so on. <laughs> she travels a lot for work, and she always uses her tablet and her smartphone. And her next trip happens to be to Athens. Very exciting for the wrong reasons, uh, but also for some good reasons, because she's into museums and art and culture, so she's excited that she will be visiting the Acropolis Museum. Um, Natalie, being Natalie, prepares beforehand. So she goes online, she looks at, she visits the museum's website and the Facebook page. The museum does have a very active Facebook page. Uh, Natalie also has a Facebook page. You can go and become friends with her. 
um, you can see it right there, the, um, the link. And um, the, she also gives permission to the museum to extract some of her information from her profile. So some of the demographic things, but also some of her interests and likes, if she has some. Um, and then she can go on and give some more information to the museum, either through a game online or when she goes to the museum on site by um, filling in or responding to this quiz. Uh, so her experience starts uh, before she goes into the museum or before she starts the museum, uh, the, the tour in the museum. And um, she can give, provide some more information that are more visit specific, just like uh, how long she will be staying. Uh, so time constraint, or what her mood is, if she's in a mood, uh, a very active mood, or a kind of normal mood, or if she's really tired because her business meeting just took too long. Um, she can also provide some more information about um, her, the movies that she likes. So uh, between these fictional, uh, unreleased movies, she probably will choose Returning to Paris, um, and uh, the newspaper sections that she likes. So. She would probably choose something like society and everyday life here, or maybe politics and economy. Less likely for her to choose sports, for example. Um, there may be some other quirkier questions, like which chair do you prefer on the three? And Natalie would probably choose the middle one. Um, and which of these is closer to her style? Um, and uh, she would probably choose the middle one again. Um, or maybe the one on the right, not so much the classic version. Um, in, a, in other words, what is happening here is um, Natalie's choices uh, will create values for these variables. 26 variables that um, cover everything from demographic information all the way to preferred level of interactivity in this visit or preferred narration style. And based on these, when Natalie completes this process of visiting online, providing her information, or completing a quiz, a story will be suggested for her. And a character narrating the story will be suggested for her, or chosen for her. And it could be something like this. An Athenian woman who lived uh, 2,500 years ago, who will talk about marriage, and talk about her son, and talk about the clothes that she dedicated to goddess Artemis, and uh, how appallingly white uh, goddess Artemis is now the statue that she can see and that Natalie can see in the museum, but she wasn't always like that. So an activity, like an augmented reality activity, could be provided for Natalie as well. She could lift up her tablet and see the original, you can see it on the left, um, statue of 2,500 years ago, washed out. Um, the plaster copy that the museum uh, restorators have created and have placed right next to it so visitors can see what they really look like, how they were colored, uh, but Natalie can actually see a 3D reconstruction uh, colorized on her tablet that uses the marble texture, which the plaster copy cannot simulate, cannot uh, create. Uh, so she can get also some more information uh, about these colors um, on her tablet, for example, uh, little details that researchers spend, all, archaeologists researchers spend all their lives on. So there are archaeologists who have been studying, for example, these kinds of patterns, and the fact that this kind of pattern over here is in the oppo opposite direction than it should be, um, and why is that? So Natalie can learn some inside information um, by looking at this augmented reality exhibit or <coughs> activity in her tablet. Now imagine one of the other visitors, uh, imagine one of the children. Uh, the quiz given beforehand will be different because the first uh, question will be, um, how old are you? And then the quiz um, will take a different form, um, asking different kinds of questions for um, younger uh, people and for adults. And. Um, <coughs> These are different questions also between the different museums. So for the Acropolis Museum, um, a child would get a question like this. For the Cité de l'Espace, it would be something different, like, um, like choose your hero from 
some cartoons like Buzz Lightyear and so on. <clears throat> Uh, now, the two museums have come up with what they want to convey, the messages they want to show to their, uh, to convey to their visitors, and that's where it all starts. Um, so they have come up with these themes and created these ontologies, um, and based on these, the stories are written, based on the themes and based also on the personas of the visitors. So, of course, Natalie is not a real person, she's a persona, but uh, she's a persona that has been extracted and created based on real data um, that have been <laughs> compiled from observations, from museum demographic statistics, and so on. Um, for the Acropolis Museum, at this point, uh, we have created three different stories, uh, two that are um, more related to the persona of the kid, and one um, for the persona of Natalie. However, these stories can also be presented to different personas because, uh, to different visitors, because not, um, uh, it's, it's really unlikely actually that each visitor will be matched exactly with one of the personas. Um, for the Cité de l'Espace, again, the themes center around the life of an astronaut, and in this case, we have two different stories, uh, one for Céline, uh, the uh, mother, and one for Lucas, and I will uh, play just audio so you can see the difference. It's the same voice uh, narrating both stories, but there's difference in the style, in the content, in the visual presentation, and so on. Um, as long as I can find this much. Celine is the secret diary of Philippe Perrin, and Philippe Perrin is an actual astronaut who is retired now. Um, he actually did go into the Mir station as well, um, and he lives in the Toulouse area, so when the story was written and created, uh, he was consulted um, through an interview, a Skype interview that was actually done with him. Okay, so. Dear diary, it's my fourth day in space, and I really need to vent. I can't say these things to the other astronauts in here. They'll freak out. Being in space is, is overwhelming. It's, it's beyond words. Oh, thank Hawkins. For a while, I was afraid I'd ended up in the Andromeda galaxy by mistake. Hi, my name is XT555. Are you an earthly? Born and raised here on Earth. Honestly? Well, then I'm happy to meet you. So, in one case, um, for Celine, the story is less interactive. It's more like reading a diary and understanding the emotional and other parameters of living in space as an astronaut. In the case of um, the child, um, this is an astronaut that comes from the future, has landed here, and wants to um, create his sent from um, the future to create, um, uh, uh, to, be, to be a reporter and um, go back and um, put content in the journal of the ancient worlds. Um, so this is something actually that the kids at the end of the experience can print out and take with them because they help the astronauts um, uh, populate this journal. Oh, and there's another, just sound. As soon as you enter. You'll see our toilet on your left. Using the toilet was one of the trickiest parts of my training, and the most embarrassing one. Since there is no gravity in space, everything floats. And I mean everything. That's why the toilet works with suction, like a vacuum cleaner of sorts. Which means you have to align very carefully if you get my drift. So, um, you get a, a sense of the stories, even for the more serious <coughs> persona. Uh, there's humor in there, and um, uh, they try to be witty, uh, to capture and immerse the visitor through storytelling in the content that they are about to see. Uh, now, there's personalization, if you will, uh, in the presentation as well. So, in, in the same, for the same plot, for the same story, um, Natalie will have a different representation of the narrator, 
um, a marble statue of the horse, uh, but for the same story, um, Nikos, the, the child, will have a cartoonish representation of the horse. Um, also, the story will change a bit. So in, in one case, the horse is a guide. Uh, in the other case, the horse has been stuck in this time, um, in another time dimension, and the child will help to help the horse go back in time. Um, so it's, it, it may be the same theme, but presented differently. And you can see here some of the uh, representations of the same um, script unit in the same story. So um, it's about the Trojan horse. Um, and you can see it for Natalie, for Nikos, or for um, even more serious persona. Uh, here is the Greeks have been fighting the Trojans for full 10 years, but they couldn't get inside the castle of Troy. So Athena came up with a ruse. She told the Greeks to build a big wooden horse and then present it to the Trojans as a gift. Silly Trojans thought, how nice of our enemies the Greeks to give us something, even though it's not our birthday. But the horse was full of Greek soldiers, who sneaked out and opened the castle gates for the Greek army to enter and slaughter them all. Now, a more serious version, but not of the same story, um, for example, you can see on your screen, goddess Artemis, or perhaps her brother, god Apollo, riding the chariot. So for the older retired professor who wants a more serious, uh, in-depth information in a more serious way, then you can have more, uh, something more of a tour guide. <coughs> so all of this uh, begins from understanding who the users are, who the visitors are to create the personas. And this has been done by collecting data, uh, and also through ethnographic studies, extensive studies in both museums, observing users, and also through workshops with museum practitioners uh, on both sites. And uh, this has led to creating paper prototypes, initially, of, uh, of the experiences, and body storming with these type of paper prototypes. That means not only brainstorming in a room, but going around with these in the museum, and looking at them in situ, in the context, and a different, different context of each of the two museums. So you can see here, especially on Mondays when the Acropolis Museum is closed, we just camp down there uh, besides the exhibits and try to figure out how to work this out. Um, the same with the Cité de l'Espace. Here we have an out, a primarily outdoor um, museum, and uh, the experience is uh, uh, fully outdoors, um, and the museums have been really involved in this process of designing the user experiences, the storyboards, uh, the low fidelity and high fidelity prototypes. Um, so this is an ongoing process that never ends. It has this iterative design uh, approach to it, which is um, user-centered in the sense that it's participatory. So. Visitors, and especially authors, museum um, staff, are involved from the beginning. Um, of course, an iterative participatory design methodology requires evaluation in each stage and multiple formative evaluations uh, that help design the next iteration. Uh, so I will pre present a formative evaluation that was conducted at both museums. Uh, one at the Acropolis Museum in December of 2012, and the other at the Cité de l'Espace in October. Uh, the one at the Acropolis Museum was with 15 visitors of different ages, from 10 to 55 years old, um, who were observed individually um, with the tablet that was given to them. Uh, they were shadowed by an observer with the video camera and an observer who was uh, looking more closely, as you can see in this picture, um, into their interactions. They were asked to think aloud as much as possible. This one, that's why it was done on a Monday when the museum was closed, and then interviewed um, after the, uh, the experience. Um, here are some of the adults and some of the children who came with a parent. Uh, at the Cité de l'Espace, we had eight families, um, 13 parents and 15 children. Uh, each family had at least one child uh, under the age of 12. Um, same methods except for the think aloud, which is not very easy in an outdoor space. And uh, the results from the data that we collected have been organized into these themes 
um, which I will present to not all of them uh, very briefly in the following slides. So in terms of story and story plot, and this is very important to us, because engaging the visitors and bringing them in and immersing them in content that many of them would not be interested in or would not even you know, see even if they went to the museums um, is, is very important. And uh, in summary, um, the approach was very interesting and entertaining to visitors and they allowed them to experience um, the museum in a new way, in their words. Uh, however, it still remains static and not a story, and this will come back, I'll come back to this at the end, because it's a very challenging thing to create an interactive narrative. So a narrative, a story in the, poet, in the Aristotelian sense has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a climax. But if you personalize that, and you adapt it, and you allow the visitor to interact, um, then how do you achieve and how do you maintain this story flow? Um, so it was inevitable that we would get this comment, and this is something that we're struggling with. Here are some indicative comments about uh, the stories being interesting and entertaining. Uh, humor was a very big part of it. Um, humor was probably the number one uh, positive comment that all visitors in both museums uh, mentioned as what they liked the most. Um, but also seeing the museum in a new way Experiencing the museum in a new way is, uh, is important, especially for visitors who have been there. So in the Acropolis Museum case, uh, visitors who had been there saw things that they would not see, um, or they had not seen the first time they were there, or the other times that they were there. Uh, a good example is a, a statue that is really an amorphous blob right now, because it's so old, but it's a unique, there's no other statue of its kind anywhere in the world. Um, it's a statue that was half a horse and half a, a rooster. Um, and it's in the, in the horse story, obviously, because uh, the horse story um, helps you see all of the horses in the gallery. Um, it's a big success, one um, visitor says, that I now notice the exhibit because uh, I can realize its importance and value. Uh, let's see a video um, on this particular thing. You can see the body expressions in the case of the humor and engagement at the Acropolis Museum. Hi, our horse and his friends are stuck in another third dimension. Although this sounds immersive and humorous, and what you saw, um, of course, takes uh, extra, uh, extracts of, uh, of the story of the experiences of many people, uh, the story uh, had a lot of information at points where people were required to stand uh, for a long time. Because the museum does want to convey information and uh, learning content, and it can't be done always uh, with just um, uh, very short snippets. Um, so moving is interesting and standing is not, is a very characteristic comment. Uh, also, it wasn't a story. For most of them, 
uh, the additivity of the experience uh, made it come across as bits and pieces. So it's a definite narration of different flows in many cases because based on visitor initial event, the initial personalization and then uh, visitor behavior in the room, different snippets of stories were provided uh, or different script units as we call them. Um, so it was more a theme rather than a plot with subplots. Um, I, it kept me asking to go on with the story, but I was wondering what the story is all about, and so on. Navigation and wayfinding is another challenge uh, that this kind of story, uh, when it's set into the physical environment, is, um, uh, creates. So uh, exploration is fun, and that's what a lot of people liked. Um, and simple navigation in this case worked. And by simple navigation, we mean um, telling them or giving them a photo of the exhi exhibit that uh, they should go to. Um, rather static, though, um, and very difficult to understand uh, which way they're oriented. So in the case of uh, stand real still, don't turn around yet, um, then turn around real slowly, that works really well in the case that we showed. If the visitor is standing and faced uh, in, a, in a specific direction, if the visitor is wandering around, uh, stand real still and turn around is not going to work uh, if the system doesn't know exactly which way the visitor is facing. And to do that in an indoor space is quite difficult um, since GPS cannot be used and GPS will not provide that kind of information of orientation. Uh, the same. Um, Another problem is, of course, that you can't put too much equipment in a space where you have to respect the objects and interaction. Uh, at the Cité de Response, this is much more interesting and much more feasible uh, using GPS for location, but not for orientation again. So um, some uh, options would be to take into account the visiting style uh, for navigation, and this is something that one has to do. We have not done it yet and preferred level of interactivity. We have done that through our questionnaire. Um, um, but um, with exploration, there's no need to be too explicit. It's good to make it into a game. I am medium sized and extremely usable. Although there is only half of me left. Mercifully, it's the front half. Mm -hmm. I am standing near a pillar on the balcony. Go look for me. So you can give a description of the object rather than saying it's to your left, to your right, something that would not work. Um, in the absence of orientation. And still, even if you did have this information, it wouldn't be as interesting. Take a look around to find out more about the world my fellows and I used to live in. Encouraging visitors to look around, um, again, is interesting. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, one of the main problems we faced and it came out in the evaluation is this relationship between the screen, which is very dominant, and the physical space, the objects. Uh, so, people are looking too much at their screen, and one of the reasons is that they don't know when to look at their screen because something interesting may happen there, especially with all this multimedia content. Um, uh, and there were a lot of interesting visual aspects, but that made uh, the uh, looking at the screen even worse. So, a lot of them felt stressed about the fact that they had to look at the screen all the time, whereas they also wanted to look at the exhibits. Others didn't care so much about the exhibits, but about the content that was on there. Um, what some of the implications for designing and for the next iteration is to prompt visitors to observe the ex ex exhibits more, and to try to weave this into the story. I'm afraid you won't be able to meet this monster in person, because she's not here, but you can have a good look at her on your screen. So these are prompts in the narrative that tell the visitor to look onto um, to the screen, but maybe more are needed. So visual and audio cues, or maybe even um, vibrating the tablet of some sort, um, or pointers on where the visitor should be looking at on the screen, um, different ways of doing this. Uh, also, post-visit and souvenirs, um, ways to put information into a cart so it can be looked up later, uh, could help improve um, both the static aspect of the experiences um, and the screen versus physical tension. Uh, now in terms of personalization, 
um, there are various things that one can do um, to control pace, to highlight some recommended choices, uh, to provide more information, uh, to provide channels of information that can support the work of parents, especially in the case of the Cité de l'Espace. This was a, a problem because most parents go there for their children, they're there to support their children's visits, so they don't get as much out of the experience as they could have. Um, and also, time-based adaptation is an issue because uh, some hard constraints that people have only two hours to spend should really be taken into account. Otherwise, um, they have to be uh, intelligently addressed uh, because people, when they have a good time, uh, they may um, want to spend more time in the museum than they uh, initially thought they would. Um, another challenge is how to uh, extract uh, visitor, a visitor's profile, how to create this. And of course, explicit elicitation um, would mean something like putting together or filling in a questionnaire, which is a tedious process, could be a very time-consuming process, and is not fun. Part of the experience um, would be lost, um, the positive experience would be lost in that case. Uh, so what we have done is we've done um, a study with 100 visitors in the Acropolis Museum, testing questions such as the one with the chairs and uh, the artwork to see if these um, seemingly unrelated uh, questions could give us um, some information about the values. So in closing, uh, two are the really big challenges here. How to combine storytelling and personalization or, and adaptivity. Uh, so an interactive narrative is really an oxymoron. And to adopt the story yet achieve the story flow is really our biggest problem. Um, in the case of museums, and in the case of the um, archaeological museum, authenticity is key. So the credibility of the museum, respectful interaction, the authority and the knowledge that the museum has and wants to convey, convey to its visitors um, is important to keep. On the other hand, you have to balance that with an engaging narrative, with interactivity, and with this uh, drama, this uh, immersive uh, story plot that will keep visitors engaged. Um, in terms of personalization, on the one hand, you want to provide a rich information space. Museums have this. That's what they want to show uh, in a very short, brief amount of time to a wide variety of visitors because that's what they attract. But at the same time, you have to tailor this information to individual preferences and to behaviors during the visit in the museum, which um, you have to adapt to. So. Um, we don't have the solutions to these. I don't know if we will have, that's for sure, but uh, this um, is a very challenging project, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Well, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, so uh, who would like to ask the first question? I feel like Phil Dunning. Um, it's interesting to look at this through the lens of uh, user modeling or student modeling because uh, clearly there's a lot under the hood in terms of what it is that you're trying to model and you can't just ask the questions that's important. So instead you have these innately interesting things like what kind of chair you like. Um, and then also under the hood is you're taking what you think you're learning from asking these strange questions. Um, to find out about the, I have to say user, because we use the same student, and map them onto what sort of uh, experience to provide, which in the, in the domain of tutors would be, you know, what sort of pedagogy to use. So can you say a, give us a sketch of what that process is like, of how you come up with the questions, how you come up with the mapping, and how you, and whether you try to validate whether you're finding out what you think you're finding out and whether you're getting math right. Yeah, well, what we've done so far. Okay, well, actually, we submitted a paper to UMAP and exactly this thing, but it got rejected. <laughs> so I can give you the paper if you want, unless you reviewed it. <laughs> so then you know the answer. <laughs> but we haven't been that successful, probably. Um, so, yes, we have uh, collaborated with a psychologist uh, and uh, we. We came up with these different ways of 
um, trying to, like the, uh, the questions that you saw, basically the two, the one with the chair and the other with the, uh, with the Mona Lisa, uh, those are the ones that, we're, that we were studying with visitors at the Acropolis Museum. Uh, so we tried to think of ways to populate um, with values some of the um, variables that were difficult to get out of an explicit questionnaire. Um, narration style, for example. Okay, you can probably cover that with the newspaper sections in some ways, um, but maybe not. Um, and we tried to make these connections between things such as aesthetics and perhaps the type of visitor or the visiting style. Uh, through the museum, um, and that's, we, we showed different uh, examples, like the questions that you saw, uh, different versions of the same text, um, provided in a different narrative style, and so on, and, um, and tested this with 100 visitors, who were all kinds of visitors, so we did this um, in, in three days, and um, then got some statistical results there and saw some connections, um, which though are inconclusive. So we're continuing this process. Um, I can't tell you much about what we showed because we have kind of stumbled on this roadblock. The fact that your assessments of stuff and have to be fun. Next time anybody in this room designs a pre or post test, we ought to think about the chair. Yeah. <laughs> how, how large a staff do you work with? How do you convince your sponsor to give you that staff this time and access to the museum? So, okay, um, the two museums are partners in this European funded project, in this consortium. Um, so the way that uh, this works is that when you put together a proposal, um, you have already recruited these end users, the two museums. Um, <clears throat> however, that doesn't mean that, you know, everything's nice and rosy. It's been really difficult. And we still haven't convinced the museums, I would say the Acropolis Museum, because the Cité de l'Espace is a different mentality. They're very open to this from the beginning, but they have only two people, two members of staff. Their education department is working on this, and they're only two people. So it's not a lot that they can do. Um, the Acropolis Museum, on the other hand, is one of the largest museums in the world, I think, voted this year is the third best or in the three best museums to go to. They have a completely different mentality. They don't understand technology. They don't understand why they need it. Um, I don't know how they were convinced to get into the proposal, uh, but every day we have to um, uh, make them understand why we're doing this. Uh, so it's a very difficult process. Um, and it's, it's not as these body storming meetings are very good into involving them in the process and having them understand, but I think that they're still not fully convinced. We, every time that we think that we, we got somewhere, <laughs> we have to start over again. So, yeah. Marvelous project. Is there a hand? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, maybe related to that because how, have you done any measures on how the interactive experience affects how much time they spend kind of thinking about the experience afterwards and reflecting on the content of the... You mean the visitors? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, we haven't, no. We haven't, we haven't looked at that at all. And actually the post-visit part of it is something that there are many ideas about how to do it. Um, in the case of the Cité de l'Espace, what we've done is um, in the, in the case of the child, the child helps the astronaut in the story to collect information, takes photos with the tablet, puts that information and creates this journal of the ancient world and can download, print that out or send it by email to a parent's email address and print that out. But we haven't actually looked at what they do with it later and if they do something with it. So um, this is another area that when we solve all the big issues we want to look at, but we have so much else to work on that we haven't gotten to it. Thank you. But it's true because, and the, yeah, the, the point that I made earlier about informal education context about this brief engagement period, which should lead to prolonged um, engagement, something that um, is key for um, museum education. I'm very curious about your narrative. 
Um, if you had to make a decision on how many paths in a narrative, if you had to decide today, you know, the complexity of the options, uh, what would you, what would you choose to do? You mean a number? How many? Yeah, how many paths? Uh, I think because you're, as you pointed out, there's a trade-off, right? You can't have a million paths, but because it's expensive. But if you had to come up with an approximation that would handle as many people as possible. Yeah, and I'm not sure how to answer this um, in, in terms of a quant in quantitative uh, way. In a quantitative way. Um, right now we have branching points uh, that we've defined. Um, the, story, the story structure is a, is a graph. And uh, I think that at the most we have four um, different paths at some branching points, but not all. Um, now, the, the branching points, the, the paths are not a problem because they're alternatives. So they're not a problem in terms of the total duration, which has to be kept short because, you know, this, for example, the horror story is about a 20 minute story if one does this um, at a leisurely pace, um, regardless of which path will be taken. Um, so it's not so much the number of the paths uh, as much as uh, the duration of the entire story. But I would say that um, if needed, you would probably go to a maximum of a different path for each of the personas. In the case of the Acropolis Museum, there are six, um, but that would be the maximum, I would say, and probably that's not needed. You ready? Uh, you had mentioned uh, that most people travel to museums and groups um, so then promoting conversation between the members becomes important. Um, have you looked at how these narrative experiences affects that conversation or uh, if you know that in yeah. thoughts? Well, at this point we haven't looked at groups um, besides the family groups which were sharing um, for the most part the same tablet, meaning that um, either the parent was uh, handling it and the, the kids would uh, see from the parents or the other way around. Um, in some cases, there were there was a tablet per person in the family, um, but they were doing a separate thing. Um, now that's also another challenging uh, thing to to be able to foster this kind of social interaction, and this again can be approached in the narrative. So um, there's there are ways to understand or know um, whether somebody is visiting with a peer or um, a child and giving them different experiences but adding in prompts to see where the other person is and or send something to the other person add to let's say a common cart if you will um, a basket or do things like that we haven't explored these yet but um, because one of the things with digital experiences in general is that as computer scientists, we create for a person, especially when we're talking about personalization. So this issue with groups is another whole story that we don't really consider. Okay, uh, well, please hang on for one second. Uh, thank you, Maria, for the thought provoking talk. Vanya and Fazel for running a great interactive events last night. So thank you so much for all the presenters and everyone. Andrew, would you like to say a few words of the plan tonight for the banquet? Uh, remind people of the buses. Yes, so um, tonight uh, there is a banquet and the buses will be loading up on Patterson. Patterson is the street on the opposite side of FedEx building. Uh, the buses will load at 6.30 and we're going to have a great time at the banquet tonight. It's open at the zoo. It will be uh, a little bit cooler tonight, so hopefully the evening will all join us. Oh, and also another announcement for some of you who came in late. We have parking passes to uh, parking passes to conquer parking in the parking garage. So if you're driving from a, a hotel that's far away, um, just check in with volunteers and we'll, we'll give you some. Thanks, everybody.